Glacier National Park in Montana has 700 miles of trails through its rugged mountains. From Hidden Lake Overlook, you can get a great view of Bear Hat Mountain, shaped like a bear's hat. Check out the hoodoos in Utah's Bryce Canyon. Huge pillars of rock ranging from person size to 10-story building size. And while you're in Utah, head to Canyonlands National Park to watch the sunrise from Mesa Arch. With its canyons and gorges carved from the Colorado River, it's like stepping onto a different planet. Redwood has some of the tallest trees, on this planet anyway. Take a road trip down the California Coastal Highway. Keep going southeast and you'll hit Yosemite, land of valleys and waterfalls. It's where you can see the iconic Hat Dome and his buddy, El Capitan. This is a picture of a rock. And this is Pictured Rocks National Park in Michigan. It stretches along Lake Superior, the biggest and deepest of the Great Lakes. Its clear water is great for scuba diving. Check out the bears in Alaska's Katmai National Park. It's open all year, but your best bear watching windows are July and September. Watch out for gators. You're in the Florida Everglades, and you're on a boat. I mean, you can snooze log through the marsh, but the boat option seems pretty good. Devil's Tower in Wyoming stands 867 feet base to summit, with climbing routes of all difficulties. Climbers are asked to stay off in June to respect the ceremonies of the Plains tribes. So while you're in Wyoming, try Grand Teton in the Teton Mountains. If you're lucky, from Oxbow Bend, you can spot wildlife like the mighty pronghorn. Or journey through the Yellowstone Caldera. This is considered an active volcano with crazy geothermal events like Old Faithful Geyser and multicolored thermal pools of pigmented bacteria. And finally, you've got to spend a day at the Grand Canyon. On South Rim, check out the view from Yavapai Point. Then take a mule ride down into the mother of all canyons. America's national parks have so many things to do. Planning ahead will help you make the most of your short time. Welcome everyone to chapter 13. Now we are looking all about sustainability in our quest to get ProStar 2 worked through. This is Chef Hawks. Let's jump right on in. So back in 1864, US Congress created national parks and the Audubon Society and Sierra Club are also part of this drive to try and protect the environment that we have and to make sure that we have things for generations to come. So the EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency. That's it's a federal agency of the United States government. They are there to protect human health and the environment, to conserve water, energy, and natural resources, and to research new technology that can help them to do this and promote practices that, um, that efficiently use energy. Approximately 1 million restaurants and food service operations exist in the United States. And so because of that, because of the huge scale of what these organizations use in our environment, they have the opportunity to lead the way in conservation and sustainable use of our resources. So how do we do that type of thing? So we have to read deeper into this. So sustainability means that we meet the current resources needs in our society, but it does not compromise the ability to meet future needs of our society. And then conservation is all about limiting the use of those resources so that we are sustainable. Food service operations are using natural resources every day of the week. We use water, natural gas, land, where we're either growing plants or animals or actually having our establishments. And then the infrastructure, we're using things like electricity that require um, energy to come from either wind power, nuclear, solar, or coal, or other fossil fuels as well. So when we're burning these fossil fuels, we're creating carbon. And so as you can see from the diagram on the right here, this creates carbon that goes up into our atmosphere, um, carbon dioxide as well as carbon monoxide and various other gases, which create what we call the greenhouse effect. It traps the heat around the earth. So as you can see on our diagram over here, we have the heat that comes from the sun, which naturally warms the earth. We need that. 
We need that, otherwise our Earth would be cold and barren. We wouldn't be able to survive. Some of that heat then is reflected back off and escapes back into, uh, into space. Some of it is held by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we need some of that heat energy to be maintained. The Earth generally, on average, is around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but without that atmosphere, we'd be at zero degrees Fahrenheit. So all life as we know it would be dead. So we need that atmosphere to, to hold on to some of that heat energy, but not as much as it necessarily is when it's being compounded with the additional greenhouse gases that we're emitting into our air. So this can actually help us um, to mitigate some of these things if we start looking more carefully at how we behave in our own uh, environment. This stuff here probably wouldn't be accepted in the supermarket. So. No, that's right. Yeah, and with a bit of leaf. One of the big yeah. advantages of community-supported local agriculture is that it helps change the bigger system. Because when people don't demand food out of season, it won't come. We're getting really disenchanted with the food we're eating and why were we eating food that was from a different country when we know it can be produced 100 k's from our house, if not 50 k's. So from a climate change perspective, food is a big part of the problem in terms of agriculture and all the emissions from getting it from farm to the house. Oh, oh another one. Through the model of CSA or community supported agriculture, it can be a part of the solution. Small ones are for one person. And it's eat seasonally, eat locally, and have more connection to your food than we currently have. My experience coming from fourth generation dairy farmer, I purchased the farm off mum and dad, and then we had falling milk prices, rising costs, and drought, and as a result of that, I lost the farm. I set up Food Connect because I looked at the whole food system and I thought, wow, it's, the distribution is where the power is. And that was where I thought, well, if I'm going to do anything about it, I need to get involved at that point. CSAs take many different shapes and forms. I'm fortunate enough to travel around the country and I see lots of them. Food Connect is based in Brisbane. It's basically built around the community backing farmers within an agreed distance of could be three or four hundred kilometres and creating the support for the farming community by the community. So now we're just doing half the cabbage. Yeah, that's yes. a good idea. Yeah. It's a bit more manageable. It's very much demand driven rather than supply driven. So the customers put their orders in, we ring up the farmers, tell them how much we want. Monday morning that produce arrives um, and then Tuesday we pack it into boxes and it's in their homes on Tuesday afternoon. So what we're talking about here, especially for our food service environment, is if our food is coming from a long distance away, we are creating food miles. So food grown in the surrounding region is going to be what we call local sourcing. And so this means that we're using less fossil fuels, less diesel, less, less gasoline, to be able to move that food to, uh, to get to our doorstep. So this is an important trend that we're seeing uh, within our sector right now. So we need to try and reduce those travel, um, the, the travel miles that food is making um, so that we can lower the uh, environmental impact that we're making burning all of those fossil fuels. For many of us, we've gotten used to have year-round supply of almost everything we like to eat. But do we know where our food comes from and what it takes to get into our kitchen? How much of the food that we eat need to travel on long journeys? How do these food miles affect our planet? The term food miles first appeared in 1994 in a report called the Food Miles Report, The Dangers of Long Distance Food Transport. In order to quantify our food-related carbon emissions, the researchers suggested to measure the distance food travels before being consumed, the so-called from farm to plate. Since this report, the idea of food miles gained traction not only sparked many studies in academic circles, but also received substantial attention in the media. But why do food miles matter? It is because our Earth is made up of four dynamic, closely connected, and interdependent spheres. The environmental impact of moving our foods around often have a ripple effect far beyond their roots. Planes, trains, trucks, ships, and cars that use gasoline and diesel fuel release a large amount of carbon dioxide in the air. 
About 40% of the emissions stay in the atmosphere for 100 years, and some even longer. This buildup thickens Earth's insulation blanket, pushing global temperatures to go up. But the impact doesn't stop at the atmosphere. Because of the raised temperature, polar ice caps and glaciers calve off into the sea and melt. This expansion of ocean water in our hydrosphere floods coastlines worldwide, drowning humans and wildlife in the biosphere and eroding lands of the geosphere. Rising sea surface temperature also intensifies wind speeds of storms and causes them to be wetter. Another problem of higher temperature in the atmosphere is that moisture evaporates from lakes, rivers, and topsoil. Now, water vapor is also a heat-trapping gas. This sets off a vicious cycle that results in drought and water shortage, putting countless species in our biosphere at risk. Let's start out by looking at our land-based proteins. So, demand for animal products has dramatically increased over the years. Industrialized farming has transformed the way that we are now able to get different foods, so that they're mass-produced and they're very, very available. The amount of product that's available is huge. The price of meats has dramatically come down over time, whereas back, you know, hundred, two hundred years ago, meat would be a luxury item. Now it's something that's expected in almost every meal that people eat, and and world, 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 worldwide availability of these things、um, has come to fruition as well. So there are some critiques about、uh, the industrialized farming techniques that are that are used. So unfortunately, it does confine animals. Mostly, as you can see with the chickens on the right hand side, they're kept in very, very small spaces.、Uh, large volumes of waste and carbon dioxide are produced、uh, by this intensive farming system, and, and significant amounts of energy and water is used to do this. And there are some legitimate、uh, co uh, concerns from animal rights groups about the inhumane conditions that a lot of animals are kept. Now we can look at a different way, an alternative way that we can do some of these things. Why do we need to change our food system? Every day you have to eat, just like the other 7.2 billion people on the planet. By 2050, at least two billion more people will join you. Will you be able to continue eating the same way? Let's take a look together at four examples of our food system's limitations. First limitation: one out of every three people suffer from malnutrition. Seven hundred and ninety-four million people suffer from hunger. And two billion people do not have sufficient access to vitamins and minerals necessary for growth and development. On the other hand, 1.9 billion people overeat, and 600 million of those people are obese. Consequently, more people suffer from illnesses such as type 2 diabetes. Second limitation: our food is too rich in fat, sugar, salt, and meat. This type of diet has an impact on health and the environment. For example, it can lead to increased heart disease and higher greenhouse gas emissions from meat production. In addition, our food is less diverse. Seventy-five percent of our food now comes from only twelve plants, including rice, corn, and wheat, and from five animal species, including cows, chickens, and pigs. Third limitation: one third of food is wasted. Out of all the food we produce, one third is not consumed but thrown away. Fourth limitation: our natural resources are under pressure. Sources of fresh water are running dry, and existing water resources are becoming polluted. Thirty-three percent of soils are degraded. Our biodiversity is threatened. With tropical forests disappearing and many plants and animals endangered, such as bees, these problems are intensified by climate change. Such limitations clearly show that our food system must be transformed. Each step of the food system—production, processing, distribution, consumption, 
needs to be adjusted to ensure healthier food to our growing population and to reduce its environmental impact. But above all, it is necessary to bring all the stakeholders together government and health authorities, producers, consumers, business people, to break down the silo thinking, examine all the points of view, and work together to define the actions necessary to produce and eat food differently. For example, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and decrease levels of overconsumption. You too can participate in change. Ask yourself about the food that you produce or eat. Eat a balanced diet and reduce your food waste. A great way that we can look to protecting the environment, but to be able to yield things from the environment, is to look at organically produced foods. So these are produced without pesticides or synthetic fertilizers. And they are done by conserving oil and water, They're using no antibiotics or growth hormones. These are all regulated by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. And so this is all about um, having their national organic program that farmers um, and ranchers can actually use to make sure that they're within these confines so that they are doing something that's sustain sustainable for the future. Let's do a little comparison between organic and conventional farming. So when it comes to things like fertilizing crops, so organic farmers would use natural materials. When it comes to managing weeds, organic farmers would till, mulch, and hand weed, literally pulling weeds out of the ground. In terms of conventional farming, for fertilizing, they use chemical-based materials, very often petrochemicals. And then for managing weeds, they would use chemical herbicides. When it comes to managing insects, Organic farmers would use insect traps, and they would also use different methods to disrupt mating patterns of those insects and pests. When it comes to managing growth and diseases within the uh, crops that they're growing, they'd make sure that they have clean surroundings, clean grazing areas, and healthy diets for their animals as well. When it comes to conventional farming, then they would use insecticides to manage the insects. And as well as having clean surroundings, they would also have healthy diets, but also use antibiotics and hormones uh, for the animals as well. Coffee production can have a huge effect on the environment. Now, in the United States, there is a significant amount of coffee that's consumed every single day. 64% of American adults drink at least one cup of coffee, if not more, every single day. This means that just to feed the insatiable uh, habits of the United States wanting to drink that coffee, we need to have 30 million acres of farmland around the world in 60 different countries that feed into uh, producing that coffee. An increase on a global scale is just continuing. There are environmental effects that come from growing coffee. So there are two different types of coffee. The first that we're going to talk about is sun coffee. This is where forests are completely cleared or, or sig significantly thinned to make room for more crops, more coffee crops. They requ require strict management um, to maintain that thinning so that those coffee beans on the coffee plants get lots of sun. The first, there are fertilizers and pesticides that are used consistently. This, is, uh, this helps them to be able to meet that global demand. And it also increases the profits that the farmer makes on his coffee beans. Studies have been done by the Sustainable Agriculture Network and Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, and then they found with sun coffee that there are some negative effects. Rainforest habitats have been damaged. Migratory bird populations, especially in Latin America, have been dramatically affected in a negative way. So this is where something that's more sustainable can be used. Shade-grown coffee. If you can look at the photograph on the right here, we can see these are the coffee plants right here creating the coffee beans whilst being in amongst an actual ecosystem of a forest. So 
This benefits the local ecosystem. The coffee grows underneath other taller trees and it's home to many wildlife species. By having it as part of a, uh, a full biosphere of, uh, of, uh, of an environment, of its own ecosystem, no fertilizer or pesticides are generally needed. Shade grown coffee helps the local coffee producing economies, and it but it is more expensive. But this is something that um, a restaurant or a hotel that's serving these coffees can brag about. And very often it's been shown that Americans are willing to pay more to have a more sustainably produced product. When it comes to seafood, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, which is formed under the United Nations, indicated that 75% of the world's species have either been fully fished, overfished, or have been depleted. This is a significant problem for the world that we have to meet this issue. Desire, demand for seafood is continuing to increase. By 2030, not far away, 40 million plus additional tons will be needed every year to meet global demand. Can we meet that? This is when it comes down to aquaculture. So when we're looking at the waters of our world, farming of seafoods um, can be done. You can see if the photograph on the right of these large nets, which are set up to actually farm things like salmon, has been done extremely successfully. It's done under controlled conditions, and now it amounts to about 50% of food that's eaten each year is actually farm raised. In your restaurant, you can actually look at having both farm raised and wild caught options on your restaurant menu that can give you that good balance. But at least that way you can be more ecologically thinking when you're looking at creating your menu. Water is an important resource for the restaurant and food service industry. Chefs need it to make the food, servers need it for customers, and employees need it to keep everything clean. Industry professionals can never compromise the safety and well-being of their guests when trying to find ways to save water, but they can make some simple choices that save water, protect food, and satisfy customers. Begin by looking for options that reduce the amount of water you would use for a task, like planning ahead to thawing items in a cooler rather than in a sink with constant running water. Scrape and soak dishes in standing water rather than allowing a running flow to do the job. You can also limit water usage by sweeping outdoor areas instead of spraying with a hose or using timers on sprinklers. Another way to conserve water is to follow best practices for equipment use and maintenance. For example, use high efficiency sprayers in the dish room and load dishwashers correctly to prevent running dishes through a second time. Repair things like leaks quickly. A small leak can waste more than 50,000 gallons of water a year. That's enough water to fill a very large swimming pool. Train employees to conserve. Show employees how and why water conservation is important. And don't forget to follow up to ensure policies are being followed. Encourage your customers to conserve too. For example, do not automatically serve water. Customers who want water will ask for it. Restaurant and food service operations have a responsibility to use as little water as needed to keep their patrons safe and happy. Many of the conservation steps are actually easy to take and ultimately help lower costs and benefit the community. In general, in the United States, we get our water from two different areas. It can be from surface water. This is the water that lays on the top of the Earth's surface in lakes and oceans, um, and, and also from snow on our mountain caps as well. Groundwater is what's beno below the Earth's surface. So this is where you'd have public and private wells um, pumping from aquifers, and about 40% of the United States relies on groundwater. You can see in this diagram right here that you have the land right here where you have the unsaturated zone. This then leads into the water table. So you can see our surface water here 
and our water table follows approximately around that same kind of area. But this whole area of rock here is saturated. Um, you can actually see um, it within here, this is a closer up look, where you'd actually have air pockets right around here until you get to the approximate level of the water table when it's completely saturated. And this is, uh, is where we would pump for groundwater. When we're looking at water conservation, this is an important thing because the effects of water shortages can be huge. It can limit food supply and make prices rise because of that limited supply. Businesses and farms can close down if they cannot operate without water. Unemployment in that case can also rise and we can end up having brush fires and dust storms because everything starts to dry out. And then residents would end up just leaving that area, depleting that area of civilization. So what can we do as an industry? We can limit our usage. We have to think a little more smartly about this. So our options to reduce water, we have options to reduce water, plan ahead for things like thawing, like we saw in the video. If you take something out of the freezer, put it into the refrigerator or a cooler, and let it slowly um, defrost, rather than having to put it into running water. Scrape, scrape and soak dishes, so that, that way they come clean much, much quicker and easier without so much significant water usage. Sweep outdoor areas instead of using high pressure water, uh, water jets to clean them off. Use timers on sprinklers or even sensors that sense when it's rained so you don't unnecessarily over water. Follow some, be some best practices within the industry, looking at things like high efficiency sprayers that use significantly less water to still do the same job. Load dishwashers correctly so that they're more efficient and repair any leaks. They can end up costing your business money, but also they're a terrible detriment to the environment because we're just wasting perfectly good water. Train employees to conserve. Ensure that policies are followed as a manager to make sure that they're doing the correct thing. Encourage your guests to conserve. Um, don't, use auto, uh, don't automatically just serve water to people if, they, if they're not necessarily going to drink it. But on top of that, if you're running a hotel, then you can have a towel operation that very often a lot of hotels do where they ask residents who stay for more than one day to use those same towels, maybe for a couple of days. Restaurant and food service owners can do their part too by buying equipment and designing their facilities to better conserve water too. Energy conservation can be a significant thing, but you have to look at the areas that you're actually going to make those savings in order for it to make the greatest effect. The Intercontinental Hotel in Madrid has stood as a landmark on the Spanish capital's leisure map for the past 60 years. The group boasts nearly 200 hotels worldwide and as such is a large consumer of energy. A survey in 2016 showed usage at the Intercontinental in Madrid was high, particularly in the eight pump groups that serve its HVAC systems and hot water supply for guest rooms, kitchens, and other facilities. Intercontinental is very uh, interested in increasing the sustainability of the chain, in fact, and uh, has developed a program called the Green Engage. In this program, all the hotels have goals to get a better level in this uh, Green Engage program. XL Industrial, who carried out the study, concluded that huge savings could be made by installing ABB electric motors and drives. During this field work, we observed that decreasing 10% the frequency of the motor was saving 40% of energy. Based on the findings, the pumping systems were equipped with 13 ABB ACH 550 variable speed drives and 16 electric motors with IE3 energy efficiency classification and integrated into the building management system. Since the work was carried out in 2016, Energy and cost savings are up. We've reached with the new installation we've done in 2016 practically 
saving in energy compared to the to the equipment we had before. Approximately, we are saving around 30,000 euros a year in only electric energy. The electric motors and drives are also quieter and require less maintenance than their predecessors. Due to the very good results in the hotel in Madrid, the Intercontinental Group has shown great interest in rolling out ABB solutions also to other hotels of the chain. When we look at overall all the different uh, costs and usages of energy, we can see HVAC, the heating and air conditioning, comes up to almost a third of our expenses and our usage of energy. So as you saw on that example, the Intercontinental, they're starting to save now 30,000 euros per month um, by making those upgrades. That's a significant financial savings that should actually pay off for the investment that they've put in. So financially, it makes sense for their business. But on an environmental, um, on an environmental level, it's huge. It's fantastic to see. But we can also see through food preparation, there's a significant amount of energy that's used. Um, in, we, me we measure energy in BTUs, British Thermal Units, but, the, but more than a third is done with food preparation and production. A lot of that will be done uh, with the actual cooking method that you use to cook certain foods. Sanitation, that requires 18%. Well, we can't do away with sanitation, but are we being efficient with our sanitation? Refrigeration, it's only 6%, but there may be some savings there if you buy some higher efficiency uh, models of refrigeration and freezers and maintain them. Make sure the seals aren't cracked. Make sure they're working so you're not leaking cold air from your refrigeration. And then lighting, is it high efficiency lighting? It's amazing these days how much you can save in energy by using things like LEDs and fluorescent lighting rather than using the old incandescent style lights. We can lower those costs significantly. Let's take a look at the importance of energy efficiency and how that plays in to both renewable and non-renewable energy sources that we have access to. So non-renewable energy sources are things like fossil fuels, natural gas, coal, propane, crude oil. These are from plant or animal remains that have been buried deep in the earth, come under huge amounts of pressure to create these fossil fuels that we extract from the earth. Renewable energy, on the other hand, is where we're creating things like, uh, where we're creating electricity using things like solar, nuclear, wind, and others. Greenhouse gases are created when we burn fossil fuels. Carbon, carbon dioxide and water vapor um, go up into the atmosphere, and as we've already talked about, that's trapped, uh, that traps in the sun's heat in our atmosphere and causes our temperature on the Earth to rise. By using more of our renewable energy resources, we can actually work against that. We can start using less carbon-based products, and so we have some different options. So we have water, uh, which is hydropower. This is where we're directing and harnessing or channeling moving water. Um, this is determined by how quickly water moves as to how much energy we can create. And large amounts of energy is possible with certain types as well. The most common, this is the most common renewable energy that we use around the, around the world. Wind energy comes by blowing fan blades on these huge wind turbines. The lift causes the blades to turn, and that's connected to a drive shaft, and it turns a generator that produces electricity. Solar, or photovoltaic, or PV, are solar cells, which change the sunlight into electricity. Solar power plants can actually use either solar coll uh, collectors to heat fluids to create electricity, or to produce steam to power a generator to produce the electricity. Geothermal is actually using the heat that's inside the earth. It doesn't take too much digging to go down to actually come to a very, very continuous um, temperature that you can actually then use water uh, to actually pump through into a geothermal system to actually maintain a very equal temperature all the way through the year 
which can maintain buildings and houses. Biomass is where you have stored energy from sun through photosynthesis. When we talk about photosynthesis, we're talking about plants. So we're looking at things like wood, different crops, manure, where that's been digested crops, um, as well as some types of garbage. When they're burned, they release heat, and this can then be turned into electricity. We should have an energy efficiency plan with the industry that we're in. This should be based on usage needs, and it should be able to enable the management to make changes uh, for the better. And online tracking programs are also there to help you in this endeavor. Saving energy is a significant thing, and so there are some guidelines to help us do this. So we should be looking at limiting usage by turning lights off, setting timers, um, and things like parking lots, not having them lit during the day when the sun's up, but having those come on, or if you have detectors to see when the sun is starting to go down so that lights come on, but they shouldn't just stay on all day long. Keep exterior doors closed, so this way we don't have heat just rushing out, or cold air just rushing outside when we're just um, burning electricity for no good reason. There are definitely ways that we can make a difference in what we purchase. So when you're purchasing new equipment, buy energy efficient options, which are ENERGY STAR rated. This is uh, where they're certified to save energy in comparison to non-energy star equipment. Light bulbs, we can always use compact fluorescents and LED bulbs. There are lots of different options around now, some that are dimmable, some that have different colors. Lots of different options, but they save significant amounts of energy. Follow best practices. Always power up and power down equipment um, with different schedules, so that, that way you can make sure that things aren't just on unnecessarily using timers and regular cleaning and maintenance can save a significant amount of electricity and power in general just because things will run more efficiently when they're, when they're maintained train employees to conserve as well if you have a kitchen in a hotel if that hotel isn't operating at full steam because it's two o'clock in the afternoon and most of the guests are not eating or drinking anything at that particular time then why have every single oven on Maybe turn some of the ovens off so that way you can save. You can have a couple of ovens there just in case if you get a pop of a few customers coming in, but you're not just burning electricity or gas for no reason. Always make sure that you have a, uh, a management on board with this as well to make sure that these kinds of policies are being followed. When it comes to commercial buildings, they use about 17% of the greenhouse gas emissions that we actually produce around the world. So this means that they actually cost about $100 billion per year uh, in terms of creating these greenhouse emissions. If you have Energy Star certified buildings, they're going to use about 35% less energy and so create about 35% less emissions. A green building uh, conserves energy more efficiently and it reduces the overall impact on its environment. The LEAD buildings, which is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, show that they have contractors that, um, and architects that are certified in understanding how we make these efficiencies. They comply with natural standards for green construction, sustainable site developments, and they also look to save a lot of water and using materials that are more env environmentally friendly and more sustainable. The indoor environment. Uh, environmental quality should be higher as well. The site selection um, can mean to use uh, use a, a certain site that has access to public transportation. You want to use natural light, as you can see in the photograph here, as much as you possibly can, so you reduce the amount of electricity you're burning to light up rooms during the day, and capitalize on that light by both saving energy and money. Insulation can significantly change the way that energy is burned in a building. So make sure you insulate the exterior walls, floors, and ceilings, and use double pane windows to make sure that you're making those savings too. 
Landscaping can be a significant thing as well. Adding greenery can absorb heat during the summertime and it can actually maintain during lower temperatures as well. Create green roofs of plants, as you can see in the photograph here. This can actually insulate um, against either hot or cold temperatures outside and it absorbs energy and it reduces water flow uh, into that environment as well. When it comes to looking at the front of house uh, design, we can look at some non-wood and wood products, but using wood composites. Um, if you use uh, the Forest Stewardship Council wood, this means that you're using wood which is from a sustainable and well-managed forest, which has its benefits. We should always be looking to try and recycle as much material as we can. Use recycled flooring, bricks, stones, and paving materials. Try and incorporate used, steel, used, used structural steel uh, in plumbing fixtures and cabinets. And then always try and recycle any used construction materials rather than having them going into landfills. Landfills are something which is necessary for our society. However, we should be using them as little as possible so that we can eliminate as much uh, as we possibly can. They take up a lot of space. They produce methane gas or methane gas. 34% of methane emissions come from our landfills as well. Food service operations use about 100 billion pounds um, a year of uneaten, prepared foods. They just get thrown away. What a horrible shame this is. But about 40% of all commercially prepared food is wasted. And that costs about $165 billion per year. So we should be looking to reduce, reuse, or recycle. So let's look at how do we do that kind of thing. So this would cause a huge benefit to our environment. And it would benefit our bottom line as well, because we're not unnecessarily wasting money on these things too. It comes down to smart planning. Accurate uh, production forecasting for what you're going to need for your service. Purchasing correctly and in a smart way, and then always working with suppliers to consolidate packing and shipping materials as well. We can repurpose food. Anything that guests did not eat, and or that were prepared in advance or not sold, you can never reuse food that's been served though, because number one is always safety, and um, so we have to make sure that that food that's been served that cannot go back to anyone else. But we can, we can create a controlled environment that's safe from cross-contamination and safe from time and temperature abuse by being smart about the way we prepare foods and hold foods. We can uh, reuse foods in three different ways. So serve in the original format. So I have some asparagus right here. Well, we, we may have blanched some asparagus and it never went out into, uh, into our chafing dish on that buffet. And so it wasn't used for that event. It just stayed in the refrigerator after it was blanched. What can I do with that? Well, I can repurpose that food for another format. So maybe I can use that asparagus to make some cream of asparagus soup. Or how about if it turned out that I still had some asparagus left over that was never even taken out of the refrigerator and we're not going to use it for our next banquet. I can always donate that food to a local uh, food rescue program. Salvaged or recycled uh, materials can always be used as well. Flooring, furniture, and countertops. Used furniture and equipment can always be used as well. And recycled paper is always significant because burning through menus, signs, and stationery um, that any restaurant or hotel may use, uh, make sure you recycle as much of that as possible. Compostable utensils and dinnerware are also available now. A lot of them are made from sugarcane or cornstarch. Charitable organizations and homeless centers are always there as well to take donations. This can be uniforms, furniture, appliances, unwanted computers and electronic equipment, old cell phones, and also used cooking oil can be uh, recycled as well to make into a biodiesel. There are actually some uh, establishments that actually use that to run their delivery trucks and store vehicles with. By recycling, we can change that waste, that trash, into valuable resources. We have um, the most uh, most recycled products out there 
of paper, metals, bottles and containers, and plastics. They're all relatively easy, and actually some of them can end up saving us money rather than us having to produce them from scratch. Recycling other things in some areas is more possible than others, but always check with your local authorities. Things like fluorescent light bulbs, cooking oil and grease, cell phones, acid and NICAD, uh, nickel cadmium batteries, uniforms, used furniture and appliances, and computer equipment, and ink, cart ink cartridges too. But we can have some great uh, environmental and operational benefits from all of these recycling uh, efforts. It prevents pollution. It reduces the greenhouse gases that we produce. It saves energy. And it can generate additional revenue in certain areas as well. With guests seeking environmental options, they're always looking at great ways that you're working to make sure that you're having less of an effect on the, on the environment. It makes them feel better when they use your services. Then we also have composting. Rather than taking all the, all the decomposing food matter that we may have and just throwing it into a landfill, this is valuable resources that can be used in the future as well. So what is composting? This is where you have biological decomposition. Natural, uh, a natural form of recycling It actually takes the organic material as it decomposes and makes it into an organic fertilizer. Hey Jack, what are you working on? I am working on a vermicompost and right now I am putting the holes in the air hole. Alright. Now what we will be putting in our compost bin are some paper, cardboard, grass clippings, and some soil. And also some vegetable trimmings, and as well some eggshells and some other stuff from the kitchen. Okay, so Jack, what's the difference between vermicompost? and regular compost. So a vermicompost has all of these worms in them that we have um, caught. They're all in the dirt right now, but you know, worms right here. And then a regular compost doesn't have worms. All right. All right, we have the base of our compost right here. Next, we'll be putting vegetable trimmings in next. Then right after, the worms and Last but not least, the dirt on top of it just to protect it. My son Jack and I had a lot of fun working on that vermicompost, um, but, and it works in much the same way that a regular compost does, but it just encourages um, more breakdown by having the worms in there. Uh, and it works very, very quickly, actually. So you take organic waste uh, from things like food leftovers. No fat or meat needs to go in there, though. And yard trimmings, compostable products. Um, and then you uh, make sure you have to have the right uh, ratios in there so that it doesn't get too acidic and it doesn't get out of balance um, but it's really not that difficult once it gets going um, you can add some bulking agents in there as well that kind of help to accelerate some of that breakdown as well so this really does improve the environment because we've now taken um, a lot of the soil that's produced from there um, and put it into our vegetable patch which means that it enhances that soil it renews it it gives it a lot more um, food in there, a lot more fertilizer in there that's completely natural. So it helps to reduce pollution as well. So all of that food never went into a landfill. 
It improves the soil water holding capacity as well. And it removes tons of waste when, uh, when people do the simple task of composting. Uh, it's great because this means that uh, the the waste the waste stream is reduced down. Water treatment plants don't have to deal with more of this going into the environment as well, and it diverts reusable organic matter from our landfills. So what goes in and what does not go into our compost? So yes, you can put cardboard rolls and uh, clean paper in there. You can put coffee grounds and coffee filters food scraps, fruits and vegetables, kitchen trimmings, leftover bakery goods, paper napkins or other paper products that are soiled with food, salt, pepper, sugar, straw paper, and, uh, and wrappers, um, soiled, bo uh, soiled box board, paper bags, and paper tray liners, tea bags, eggshells, and nutshells can all go in there. What do we not want to go in there? So no dairy products, no fats, grease, or oils, no meats, fish bones, or related scraps like that, uh, and no paper with non-compostable inks in there either. But it's amazing what you can develop from there, and it feeds our, our vegetable beds every year now. Every restaurant and food service operation should have an energy efficiency plan based on its usage needs. This enables management to see where they can make a difference. After managers understand how much energy an operation is using, they can begin to make efficiency improvements. Planning ways to save energy does not have to be complicated. The simplest thing you can do is to turn off lights when you are not using them and keep exterior doors closed to avoid losing heat or air conditioning. Use timers to help with energy usage. You can program lights to go off at certain times or make sure water heaters are running at the proper minimum temperatures. When purchasing equipment, look for energy efficient options. Energy Star products are independently certified by the EPA and the US Department of Energy to save energy. You can find this seal on most equipment. Options for energy-efficient light bulbs include compact fluorescence, CFLs, used for coolers and ventilation hoods, and LED bulbs, which can last up to 12 years. Follow best practices for using equipment to save energy. For example, create schedules for powering up and powering down big items like ranges and ovens. These best practices can also include regularly scheduled cleaning and maintenance for all equipment. This will ensure efficiency and lengthen the life of the items. Train employees to save energy. Show employees how and why energy conservation is important and how each person can make a difference. Managers should also follow up to make sure policies are actually being followed. Restaurant and food service operations use tremendous amounts of energy to cook, store, hold, and serve food. Energy efficiency is the key to reducing use and cost and can make a real difference in saving both the planet and the bottom line. So at the end of the day, sustainability starts with us. It comes down to us making decisions, and you guys as future leaders in the hospitality industry have it in your hands. It's all about making yourself smart to all of these things and starting to make a difference. I look forward to seeing you all in the kitchen. Cheers.